And that was yep. the Star Trek, right? Because I'm watching a video. And <laughs> I think that I'm there sorry. were some Star Trek computers that were inspired by this. If you saw the circular monitors in the other room, mm -hmm. uh, that's obviously like if you look at the bridge in Star Trek, like all the monitors are circles, not squares, you know, and whatever. Yeah. I think that was where they got that idea. So mm -hmm. probably wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Have some magazine covers for you. You can look at some inspiring computer art on the way. You just want to kind of pan around in here a little bit. For, uh... This is what we were talking about in the front room, the Antikythera mechanism. Oh. I can never pronounce that. Antikythera, right? Yeah. Okay. Some people say Antikythera. You know, I'm a, mm -hmm. we're not Greek. So I think they uh, found we're one probably of, not going to do it right. I, I saw where they found something like that on a ship or something mm -hmm. a long time ago. Yeah, here's the, uh, here's the picture of the diver right here. Hmm. Uh, they were diving for sponges. Back then, it was the early 1900s, and they weren't putting nitrogen in the tubes. So when they would go down, they would come back up, and they would be a little bit loopy. Um, and the guy comes up, and it's like there are all these dead people looking at me. Mm. And the captain's like... What do you mean? <laughs> um, and the sixth element, or, or the sixth element, the sixth sense didn't exist back then, so he's not right. making like I see dead people jokes. Um, he's you know, literally like, seeing he's, them. He's seeing dead people. Well, the dead people that he's seeing are these statues right here. Oh my gosh! So uh, that is creepy. Let's rewind about two thousand years. What happened was the Greeks were doing very well for themselves, and the Romans like pillaging villages. Uh, and the Romans come and pillage the Greeks, and they steal a bunch of stuff from a Greek museum at a Greek town and whatever, throw it on a boat, and with the intention of taking it back to Rome. Uh, but in you know 200 BC, how good is a boat? You know, like probably not that good. So the boat sinks, and you know, like they they can't get everything, you know, uh, back to Rome, and these guys all sink to the bottom of the sea. Oh, wow. And when they dig it up for in, you know, 1900 or whatever, they also discover this kind of gear-looking thing. And they're like, huh, you know, I mean, like, it, it is kind of weird that a, a boat in, like, you know, the before times, uh, mm -hmm. not the before COVID times, but, you know, yeah. much, bef much longer before that, right? It, you know, like, why would it have a gear? That seems kind of odd. Let's put that in a box and study that later. Well... Some stuff starts flaking off, they notice some inscriptions, they have x-ray tomography, they see that there's some sort of watch and, you know, like other gear looking stuff inside of it and whatever, and they start kind of getting curious and interested. And that's when another guy does a 3D replica uh, in CAD, and that one in theory could be 3D printed, but uh, I think he didn't want anyone to print it, so there uh, there aren't any replicas that look quite like his. Uh, but then other people get really curious, and there's like a billion and one people on YouTube now that like building things from scratch. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we got this one from Dave Goodchild, and he built this uh, woodworking and all very beautifully by scratch from hand. And this is a, a number four, so he's he's done this once or twice before. In fact, three times. Um, so it can tell you where the constellations are in the sky and the planets, uh, the current moon phase. If you look around back, there's uh, solar and lunar eclipses and the next Olympics, and there's a bell that dings on special days and stuff like that. And they figure that uh, this existed at the center of like important Greek towns. Um, you know, they have a sundial everywhere, right, right, that tell the time. But this is like you know, anywhere that there would maybe be a science center or, you know, like, uh, education. Well, there was a guy before that, Eric von Daniken, who did Odyssey of the, of the Gods and Chariots of the Gods, and uh, he, he made the same assumption that, you know, mm -hmm. like, there was no way that technology could have been that advanced uh, back in those days because literally a couple countries over were throwing rocks at each other, right? Like, yeah. how did they have this... You know, he's like, well, aliens must have come to Earth and accidentally, like, left their GPS here and then, you know, 
<laughs> so, so that's you know, how we got kidnapped. <laughs> who knows? Yeah. Some cows got turned inside out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we got on some mysteries. Yeah. <laughs> so that is the antique room. I think they use those to uh, keep track of when the Olympics would be too. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. what you just yeah. said. Yeah, it's, uh, in fact, it's probably on the back. Let's see. And you can see the bells through the, uh, the little sides there. Wow. Well, about. Okay. Um, so this clock is a master clock. All right. Um, and there are, uh, you know, like, it controls clocks. Like, uh, you probably... In school, did you ever like look up at the clocks and you know, every once in a while when the time was wrong, they'd move the arms mm -hmm. automatically yeah. and correct yeah. themselves yeah. and whatever? This is one of those correctional clocks. Oh, okay. So this is this is the clock that keeps the uh, the definitive time mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then the other clocks, uh, you know, like are are the you know, ones that would have been in the classroom or whatever. So this would have been like I don't know, in the principal's office or something. And if you adjust the arms on this, it will send a signal to all the other clocks and uh, they will adjust too. That's so crazy. That's, uh, that's, that's really what neat. Guys. Well, and clock yeah, sync is very important in computers because they need to keep synchronized with each other. That's true. With all the parts inside of them. Like they will have a communication breakdown if there's a, some kind of time sync issue. Yeah. yeah. Um, and lots of things that are, uh, for example, encryption based now, like when you, you know, dial into your online bank or, yeah. you know, dial into, go to your online bank's website or whatever, uh, all of the encryption that goes between the two computers uh, might be based on time or they might use time as a security method. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, they might be like, well, that answer came too late. Right. You know, like that's it's another no computer valid. trying to hack. Uh, you've got um, your your computer will freak out that you're not you know like um, the, the, the <laughs> clock isn't set right. So you know like you'll go to a website that has like a secure website, um, and you know it'll be like you know someone uh, someone's trying to do something nasty or you know like something like that, and then you like notice that your clock is wrong or something like that. And, you set your clock and whatever, and suddenly the website works, and you're like, what was that error message? I don't know. You know um, but most operating systems these days will actually try to go out on the internet and actually synchronize your clock with, like, um, you know, a government clock or the atomic clock or something like that. So there are time servers that literally serve just the time all That's the time. crazy. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. I never thought of that. One thing that happens is, uh, I told you that Mary and Wes kind of had maybe a little bit of a thing. They went on a couple dates. Well, I don't know if it just became awkward going into the office or whatever after maybe they had a little bit of a falling out or they stopped going on dates or whatever, but she moved back to Maryland 10 minutes that way on Falls Road. Oh, wow. uh, and I guess you, you came from the north, so you didn't pack, pass the exit, but most people when they come here they pass the Falls Road exit on the way to the museum and whatever. So that's literally the road off of which she lived. And here's a, this picture is her in her house with the computer right behind her because she got to take it home. And she was the first person that we know of that ever did it. So that is a computer first, you know, the first computer to go home with someone is maybe not this specific one because right. they made 50 of them but the link is the first computer to go home with someone and uh she also got to be the first work from home i guess as a accidental bonus yeah. um, and continued to work on software and whatever and she went back to school and got her law degree so she ended up becoming a lawyer oh my gosh so like still like nobody knows like how she fought on to keep this thing instead of less having it Oh, I don't think it was really a fight. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, I guess I could ask her. She's still around. Um, oh, wow. She's, uh, she's old, but, uh, you know, she, uh, she actually gave an interview uh, with the museum. Like, during the pandemic, we did, like, a walk-around Zoom tour and whatever. And, oh. yeah, 
she uh, she did a little 30 minute interview. So that's awesome. Yeah. Uh, and she's yeah. still with it too. Like she's not. She doesn't oh, yeah. mentor it. Wow. Yeah. wow. It was amazing. It was really good. Uh, oh was, man. And she came down to, I guess. I don't know if it was the beginning of this year or the last year or whatever because I've forgotten how time works, but um, she uh, she gave a talk at Friends School, like wow. the school that she actually went to. And, you know, like we we let, uh, loaned them this so that she could talk about it. And, yeah, so pretty cool stuff. Yeah, I wish we did have her here. Did like it'll be that for start. Like we both we did something like that. Jeez. We might be able to. Yeah. Yeah. Something to note for later. Yeah, yeah, if you want to, there's actually more than just, I don't know if you can get all of them, but there's a whole oh, yeah, bunch of signatures, of signatures back there that the she side. signed and Wes signed and everybody signed. That was all of that. Yeah, good call. Thank you. You're welcome. Somebody even wrote 2007. Two, 12, yeah, I think they signed it much later than when they worked on it. Oh, wow. Pretty cool. You're like a really cool person. <laughs> I hang out with them like I info. I might yeah. as well share it with you. Oh, if you want to see what the internet looked like in the late 60s, early 70s, there's a map. That? Are you kidding me? They actually made the map of the of the whole United States. <laughs> I mean, there were only like a couple dozen people on the internet oh even in gosh. 1973. That is too funny. Um, this is actually ARPANET, so there are a couple famous networks back then. ARPANET is one, NSFNet is another one, um, and the idea of it being called the internet uh, is that they connected all of those networks together, so now you could talk across the networks, the internet. Um, you know, whatever. But you can also see. So the ARPANET. Who was that uh, established by then? Is that uh, so originally ARPANET was DARPANET, I believe. Uh, it was definitely you know like I mean there are schools on it as well, uh, but it was oh, yeah, all I just yeah. It was it was military and educational, and then eventually, uh, you know, someone decides to let some commercial companies on it and whatever, and it all goes to pot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. LA's on here on this map. Like how yeah. he said about the schools, I see that. Yep. And there's MIT right here. You can see him in this one too. Wow. But even back then, Urbanet's just, you know, like yeah. a couple colleges in Utah. Wow. Uh, and you don't even really know where in Utah. It's just like, oh, yeah, there's Utah. <laughs> you know, like, no big funny. deal. Yeah. <laughs> I think that a lot of people think of the internet as the beginning of the web. Because, like, now you don't think of anything else that you do other than just open up, like, Firefox or Chrome or whatever. Uh, but that was 1994, and there are many other services. I mean, like, think about email. Email doesn't require you to use, like, Gmail or Hotmail or whatever. You could just open up Outlook or some email program or whatever. So in the early days of the Internet, you would use a whole bunch of different programs to access different kinds of things on the Internet. Uh, you know, and this is like, I'm sure some computer nerd is watching is like, of course, uh, you know, but, um, you know, like, I think it's maybe not immediately apparent to a lot of people that, you know, like there was, there was a time before a browser and we were still excited for the internet and, yeah. you know, like there were applications where you would still click on things and do things and go places, mm -hmm. even though there was no, you know, like back then. It would have been NCSA Mosaic or Netscape or something like that that you would have used instead of Firefox. Uh, you know, so and I'm I'm using Firefox as an example because yeah. Firefox is from Mozilla and Mozilla is offshot from the Netscape team and whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so you know, like there's this whole string of evolution. But before that, there was something called Gopher. And the idea was instead of like, you know, the World Wide Web is obviously like, okay, a spider web because everything's so connected and right. whatever and looks like this. Gopher, the idea was there was an underground network of like, you know, hedgehog tunnels or groundhog tunnels or whatever. And you would pop up out of a gopher hole and see something. And then you'd go to another gopher hole and see something. And like, that was the analogy that they were trying to use with gopher. And there was another one called waste which is a wide area information system. But, 
gopher. They almost make it sound like it's whack-a-mole. <laughs> like for real. A gopher is a distributed document delivery service. It allows you to go for online information, read documents, retrieve graphics, and access other computers on the internet using menus that are very easy to follow and understand. Gopher is a program, kind of like a database, that's run in computers called gopher servers. Now remember, a server is a computer that can be accessed by many users all at once. There are now over 6,000 Gopher servers on the internet. On your computer, the software you use to access a Gopher server... Yeah, if the site went down, maybe it, you know, was whack and yeah. hmm. Let me put it this way. It's a lot like going out for fast food. At the counter, you choose what you want from an easy-to-understand menu. You're the client. They take your order and serve you a hamburger. They're the server. At the same time, they can serve a hamburger to the clients in the line next to you and the clients next to them, and they do this from locations all over the world. Sounds a little crazy, but that's pretty much the way the gopher client server relationship works. Oh, yeah, because Firefox, I mean, I think peop a lot of people still use that, so mm -hmm. that's why I'm familiar with Firefox, but with yeah. all these other stuff, uh uh. <laughs> I'm still using Firefox in the back. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Pretty cool. So another room that we should hit really fast. Okay. 